Welcome back to another Goldmark TV broadcast. Uh, we've got two fantastic things to show you today. I've got a lovely selection of Mike Dodd pots here to show you the, the extraordinary breadth and range of local materials and, and decorative techniques that he employs. So I'm going to look forward to uh, getting stuck into these in a minute. Uh, later we'll also be looking at uh, Kundung, which is the last great German Expressionist uh, periodical from, from Hamburg. It's a really fantastic story behind it and the prints are amazing. I'm really looking forward to showing you those later. First, let's get stuck in with these Mike Dodd pots. I spent some time this morning going down into our, our, our pot cellar uh, where a lot of the, the ceramics goodies are, are, are hidden, stashed away, and going through our, our Mike Dodd uh, pots and, and pulling out a, a range of, of little bottles and, and vases and things that show off just how many uh, local materials and, uh, and, and decorative techniques that, that, that Mike employs uh, and has been developing over his many years of, of potting. There's a, a huge range of, of different glazes and, uh, and uh, applications that you can see here. We've got things like uh, river iron, uh, manganese and porphyry. We've got basalt glazes, uh, local glazes made from local clays and, uh, and stones, uh, crackle slips, uh, and all of them uh, enlivened with a, a huge range of, of different decorative marks. You'll see wheat sheaves, you'll see um, scratches through slip uh, surfaces that look like sort of ploughed uh, furrows in, in fields or, or silage or, or uh, fluting uh, uh, and uh, sort of scraped marks that might represent um, the, the movement of rivers, uh, beautiful different decorative, decorative uh, uh, approaches which really show off this huge range of glazes. But really the reason I wanted to, to get these pots out and, and talk specifically about Mike Dodd is because of some thoughts I've been having during this, this very strange period of lockdown. It's, it's strange, isn't it? It's, it's thrown up a huge number of contrasts for many of us. Contrasts between those of us living in, in, in cities and, and others living in, in, in towns and the countryside who've, who've got... Uh, we're fortunate to have the, the space and the, and the surroundings to sort of escape some of uh, the isolation that, that most people are, are stuck with. And also that, that strange contrast of everybody trying to pull together and, and share uh, this time as, as a community while remaining in isolation and, and shielding away. It's also, I think, made some of us rethink some of our priorities and it has uh, ultimately slowed our pace of life. Suddenly we're having to wait for things. Um, we're having to, 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 we're given sort of space and time and, and having to, to work out what to do with ourselves. And I've found that um, recently as I walk out the front door and I venture out into the, the, the fields around where I live and the, the countryside and, and, and the woodlands, that there's a whole world out there that I've kind of noticed but not really spent the time to really look at. And I'm starting to pick up on things that I, that I, that I hadn't before. Birds and, and the emergence of, of new flowers that I've not seen, and these amazing changes of colour. Now, railing against our very digital, technological, interconnected world is, is really the low-hanging fruit. I mean, it's thanks to devices like these that we're able to bring you these films, we're able to bring art into your homes, and that we're managing to stay connected during this, this strange time. But I found myself coming back again and again to the, to the thought that um, as wonderful as these devices are, so much of our daily living, the, the things that we touch and handle, so much of our, our tactile world is like this. It's smooth, it's black, or, or white or silver. They've been beautifully designed, they're very minimal. But there's not really, uh, it's not something that provokes a reaction when you touch it. There's no relationship to be, to be built with an object like this. And for a lot of people, this is what uh, their tableware is like. It's white, it's smooth, and 
a little sterile. Mike Dodd's pots are a little bit like taking that step outside your front door and coming into that world that is so easy to forget and so easy to, to, to stop noticing. The range of colours, the decorative, different decorative marks, um, which so many years ago in the, in the sort of traditions of the, of the rustic uh, potters of, of old, uh, these marks that had a real significance, a real meaning uh, for the people who, who shared these pots. So much of that seems a little distant and it's only when you start handling Mike's work and enjoying that range of, of, um, of decoration, that range of glazes uh, and that range of very sort of personal connections that he's made between the elements of his work. But it's only really then that you start to remember what much of this pottery was for, what it was, what it was, what it was designed for, um, and the world that it reflected uh, from those years ago. I'd like to, to show you a little clip now. This is from eight years ago, back in 2012, that we filmed Mike uh, for, the, for this film. A very different time, but it shows Mike talking about where some of these different glazes come from and the kind of connections which seem so very relevant today. I hope you really enjoy it and I hope you enjoyed seeing some of these pots too. I want a relationship with the materials I'm using. I want to have a... It's like, you know, like making marks and decoration. You need, you need some sort of personal collection, connection, at least I do. And I can remember, you know, asking for felspar. I didn't even know what felspar was and, and all these things initially. And they'd arrive on a lorry in a bag and you'd open it up and you'd get your glaze book out written by somebody else and you make up these things and I'm thinking hang on a minute where do these things come from you know and you'd, you'd be driving around and you'd see oh there's a quarry there I wonder what that does this one at Moons Hill uh, produces uh, basalt um, which was a, a magma intrusion about 425 million years ago and which is extraordinary isn't it I mean you can actually take this material and put it in a glaze and reform it but once you've got a material which is local then you feel you want to get the best from it and uh, rather than have no acquaintance with something from a bag you know as you get to know something there's a it increases in depth it's not just an acquaintance it's a deepening of a, of a friendship could you call it a friendship Certainly a relationship with, with materials. I'm not sure we become friendly with materials. But, but certainly you, you deepen your relationship. And if you've got a granite dust, you want to get the best you can from that. Absolutely the best you can. So you play around with it. Then your glazes become yours. And the, the reason why anything by any artist becomes theirs is because all they have to go on is the choices. You know, whether you're throwing a pot on the wheel, whether you're making a glaze, you, the glaze comes out the kiln and think, oh, I like that, that's me. Now another potter might come along and say, no, I don't like that, I like that one. So your character, your character of your work develops through your choice of form, colour, depth, all those things which make up, which express your character, express your vitality through your character. It's all about choice. These are the main tools I use for making pots on this wheel here. So this is just metal strapping, which are usually around, say, brick pallets in a builder's yard, and they just chuck the metal away into a skip. This is a, a rib, throwing rib, uh, which is for smoothing. If I need to smooth the side of a pot or go down to the base, take out some of the clay, uh, but I find it very useful and the edge stays pretty sharp because uh, bamboo is a tough old material. These are tend to be used at leather hard stage and this is a, a sort of type of sash cording uh, which you can either roll on to give a sort of background marking or if you bend it you can make little ears of corn. Um, this is a piece of macrame or macram, macrame. Uh, somebody gave me a book on this and I made this little thing which makes a nice pattern on the side, particularly on a faceted pot, you can do that on the side. 
one of my favourite little tools that was given to me by my daughter when she was about eight. She was given a cookery set, and this is a little meat tenderizer. And being a vegetarian family, so she, she said she didn't want it, so she gave it to me and said, you could have it for your toolbox, Dad, you know. So I thought, oh, I'll have it in my toolbox. Um, I find it very useful, either as a, in a diamond shape or as a square, or using your corner, you get three dots using it in a corner all making nice little impressions for the glaze to, to sit in. That's a little favourite. Uh, these are roulettes used for centuries in pottery uh, all over the world. And when I make, and during the firing of a kiln, I'm often fiddling with a bit of clay to try and make another tool. This is just a round piece of clay with little marks in it, pushed in probably with a piece of wood like this. You hold it against the pot as it's going round on the wheel and it makes a little necklace. And you just find a way to um, find a way to make marks to suit yourself. Okay, here are a few examples of uh, the way I use these tools. This is a little square dish. The slip is moved away with your finger uh, and then I uh, fill up one of these with uh, the slip and there's a nice little story attached to these actually is um, uh, Murray Fieldhouse who was the editor and creator of Pottery Quarterly, the first proper pottery magazine we had, was in Moscow at the airport and um, he spied a row of these on the top shelf in the airport and um, he asked the young girl assistant if he could have one and she went bright red, um, which he didn't really understand at the time. And he, she got these step ladders and she put them up, went up on the shelf and she, he pulled one down. And he said, no, 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 I want five. I want five. So she went bright red again and she went up and brought them down. And of course, they're, for, they're anal douches. Uh, I don't know whether they're anal douches in England, but they certainly were in Russia. But we call them slip trailers. And, uh, and so that's what we use them for. This, um, these paddles, uh, this one for example, uh, the pot is thrown up to here so you can get your hand inside and then whacked at sort of leather hard. Little coil put around and the neck thrown on. So, uh, same with this one. Now this one is using the other paddle with the, uh, this was done with a chisel. You hit that quite hard, and then the uh, butter pat in between, all giving little different textures for the the glaze to hang in and and show up. This big pot here shows a variety of techniques. This the little uh, child's meat tenderizer is pressed in three corners there. The knife is used to do these incised marks and then the comb to differentiate between the marks. Can you hear the pot singing? Listen. That's the uh, glaze contracting. Lovely, isn't it? A little tinkling going on. Pre-industrial country wear from almost any country has a, an unpretentiousness, a vitality, um, a suitability to purpose, uh, and you know all those sort of qualities that we respond to they were strong they had to be strong they were made with urgency um, usually because of the demand um, they had to they had to be strong enough to be able to stack them in the kiln and all, all sorts of qualities which as a potter you naturally respond to you don't necessarily know you're responding to that initially but they have they have a um, an inherent integrity and a strength which um, 
somehow you have a window open in your soul to that and you want to do that and the way you do it initially is making um, the things for people to use because you want to share the feeling that you get from that uh, with everybody else. I mean I can remember at university going to the Fitzwilliam Museum and looking at some sued shower pots. Now they weren't they weren't domestic work, they were vases with brushwork, but you were just, I mean, I was in tears at the, at the vitality and quality of that work. And that's what you want. And you know that you've got this triangular relationship between, okay, you have this unexpressed stuff, you can see it in work that's been done in the past, and you want to be able to do that. Now, it takes years to actually be able to do that. Um, and also, you want people to use the stuff every day. So you learn to make jugs and teapots and casseroles. It should be made such that it's nice to use, that it's not too heavy, that um, I think Geoffrey Whiting used to call, don't make teapots that are granny wrist breakers, you know. Um, make them light enough because they're holding liquid. Make them comfortable, no sharp edges. Make sure the lid doesn't fall out. All those sort of things and then it pours pretty well and you put aside pieces and they may be on a shelf for up to two years before they're, put it, they're shown to the public. Um, uh, there's a great phrase, Michael Cardi once said, he said, uh, pottery is about the majesty of form. And when you think about that, form is actually all we know, you know, whether it's the form of music, the form of writing, the form of whatever. Uh, it's the form that we respond to. But the form expresses vitality which we can't, we have no, there isn't a form for. It has to be found in a form. Um, hence the old, the lovely Parama Sutra, what's it called? The Parama Mitra Sutra from Buddhism. Form is emptiness and empty, the very emptiness is form. I absolutely love that. And, you know, so when you get something out the kiln, like we've opened this morning, uh, that makes your heart sing, it's not because I've made it. It's nothing to do with that. It's because it actually has some quality of vitality, which will last um, to anybody else who has that openness, uh, that particular window into their soul. German Expressionism was such a, a broad and rich movement uh, that encompassed all aspects of the arts. It was not just art, and, uh, but literature, uh, architecture, theatre, cinema, really every, uh, every facet of, of, um, of sort of contemporary culture in, in, in Germany um, was, uh, was sort of reshaped under the Expressionist banner. I've got something really special to show you today. We've spent a number of years at the gallery um, investing in and, 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 and trying to source and find some really interesting German Expressionist pieces. We've handled some fantastic things. I've got here a couple of issues of Kundung, which was the last great Expressionist periodical uh, to come out of Hamburg. Kundung was the, the brainchild of Rosa Shapira and Wilhelm Niemeyer. They were two leading luminaries of the, the German Expressionist movement, and Kundung was sort of their, their, their love child. It was, uh, it was birthed in, in 1921, and it was uh, formed as an adjunct to the, to the recently established Kunstbundes uh, in Hamburg, which was a sort of a, 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 an association of patrons, of, of artists, local artists, writers, uh, academics, all of whom were committed to promoting and putting on exhibitions of, of contemporary art. Now, unlike many of the other uh, expressionist journals that came out of other uh, towns and cities in, in Germany, German Expressionism was very much a, um, a sort of geographically spread uh, movement. Um, Kundung was uh, really at the luxurious end of these periodicals. It was large and it was limited to just 200 copies per run. That meant that over a year, a subscription to the journal, which would fund the, the Kunstbund uh, membership, was at 200 marks. That was almost 10 times uh, the equivalent in, in, in Berlin. 
and it was a really lavish affair. Um, Niemeyer had 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 uh, ambitious visions for the magazine, so it would include um, criticism and lyric poetry, short stories, all set in these sort of um, wonderful ornate Gothic uh, script, a, a, a rich typographic range, and then accompanying uh, much of the material in the magazines were these beautiful printed woodcuts and lithographs. German Expressionism was a movement that grew out of a number of different cities across the country. So depending on where you were, you, the very different flavours of, of, of the movement. In Hamburg, if you were a resident of the, of the city in the, the 1920s, you probably would have seen uh, the magnificent rise of uh, Fritz Herger's Chili House building. This uh, great thrusting building, like a prow of a battleship, that cut through the corner of Pumpenstrasse. It was to become the shining example of what was known as Brick Expressionism. It was an architectural movement that sort of uh, became a, a counter to the, to the or, a, or a companion to the uh, programme in arts and, and literature. And it was characterised by monochrome, monotone brick facades, great big vast buildings. Variation was achieved by making patterns with the bricks, making these strange reliefs, sort of jutting out areas, uh, these sort of designs across the building that would cast shadow and light across it. To the local Kunstbund artists who contributed to Kundung, this architectural movement, these new buildings, must have resonated hugely. They were also working in monochrome, in the black and white of woodcuts. And like the brick expressionist architecture that used the, the natural uh, textures in the clinker, they were also employing the, the, the rich, uh, rough, jagged edges of, of, of wood. They were carving straight into the grain and using that sort of, that wonderful primitive quality of, of the cut wood as, as a source of, of, of tension and, and contrast in their work. The title Kundung translates roughly to proclamation or announcement. The whole point of this journal was that it would herald a, a new vision within this sort of late period of, of German Expressionism, a new uh, form of art and criticism that would embrace uh, aspects of, of primitive and rustic life and that would reinvigorate contemporary culture with a sort of fusion of, of the figurative and the abstract. They were drawing not only upon the experiments in, in cubism that had thrusted forward uh, uh, art of the, the early 20th century, but also the, the different cultures that those artists were drawing upon themselves. So in fact, if we look in this, this issue of Kundung, at the back, you'll even find photographs of tribal sculptures from Africa, of the kind that would have been inspiring the likes of Picasso and Vlaminck and Matisse in their work towards the abstract. The diverse styles and, and subjects that you find through the Kundung prints were sort of reflective of the society that, that these artists were now having to deal with, this sort of post-war period of, of uncertainty and, and flux. Images of, of sort of dejection, uh, a disillusionment with a with a sort of a morally and financially bankrupt society uh, following the First World War. We'll see in these beautiful images some of those tensions these artists were exploring and confronting. Hey, this is the fantastic. This is Tischgenossen by Robert Hood, that's Table Companions. A scene of three men playing cards in a decidedly empty bar. You can see that wonderful texture of the, of the wood grain that's been used to give this kind of anxious feel across the print. Hood was actually a, a combatant during the First World War and he was held uh, by the British uh, and uh, came away fairly uh, physically and emotionally traumatised by the experience. A lot of the experiences of, of those artists uh, from that time, their experiences first-hand of war, either as, as soldiers or as medical orderlies, it feeds right into this work.
scattered throughout these issues of Kundung, you'll find these Wortbilder, so word images. It was very much uh, Niemeyer's conception of the journal that it would be experimental in its use of typography, in its design in, in, in a, as a whole, not just in the art and the, the criticism that it, that it showcased. For much of that work, Niemeyer turned to, to Karl schmidt wottloff schmidt wottloff was one of the most important figures from German Expressionism. He'd been one of the founding members of the De Brucke uh, group in 1905 in Dresden. Uh, he was uh, critical to the rise of German Expressionism. Niemeyer turned to him for, for much of his help and it was schmidt wottloff who designed this fantastic front cover this sort of tumbling cavalcade of, 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 uh, of lettering that was printed with these beautiful block colours for each issue. The Kundung prints were printed in the Staatlicher Gewebeschule where uh, Niemeyer worked, that was the university in Hamburg where he worked, which gave them fantastic facilities for getting these woodcuts printed. Uh, they gave them this sort of wonderful, rich quality to them. It made it one of the most ambitious periodical projects from, from the movement. Unfortunately, the uh, collapse of the Weimar Republic and hyperinflation in Germany uh, meant that the production was quite quickly put to a halt. They started in January 1921 and only 12 issues were actually printed uh, before they had to suspend uh, production. So it's fantastically rare to be able to, to be looking through these, uh, these copies here. The fact that it survived for just those 12 issues, though, means that we're able to, to uh, experience some of these fantastic works by otherwise very little known names uh, in the, in the um, German Expressionist movement uh, from these local Hamburg artists. This is one of my favourites in the whole, the whole series that we have here. This is The Blind Father by Emil Metzel. It's a beautiful... Uh, a beautiful way of expressing uh, the simplicity of woodcut, how the simplicity of white and black, that monochrome, uh, that monochrome palette, uh, can make incredibly powerful uh, images. I love the contrast between this little girl's big black eyes and her father's white sockets up here. Very powerful stuff. And then in prints like this, this is a little rural, rural idyll by, uh, by Wilhelm Tegtmeier. And even here, in a scene that shows the sort of fields, the, the wooden huts up in the mountains, uh, the sort of rural landscape that the German Expressionist artists like to retreat to and champion in their work, even here you can see the rhythm of black and white, of light and shadow that you get in those brick Expressionist buildings. And you can feel in these... Um, in these prints and in the, the accompanying typography, the whole, the whole package, the whole Kundung package, you can feel those different strands of culture all interrelating and, and, and combining and, and feeding one each, one each other. As one of the very last periodicals in German Expressionism to have been produced and, and the last to come out of Hamburg, um, it's a real privilege to be able to handle these, but also a real fascination to be able to see this movement right on the, the cusp of possibly something new, but something that, that couldn't survive the, the financial realities, the financial hardships of, of Germany in the, the early 1920s. Uh, they're real sort of powerful uh, and, and quite, um, quite moving historical documents to be able to go through. Um, I thought you'd enjoy seeing some of the images from these. Expressionist woodcuts are some of my favourite uh, uh, works of art. I think in their simplicity and in their truth to principle and, and material, they've produced some of the most, some of the most uh, moving images of our time. Uh, I've really enjoyed looking through these, I hope you have too. Uh, 
uh, educate and detain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. It was nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. 